hope you're excited to be here today and look at recalculating. We are in our last installment of this series. I want to thank Steve Webster for doing a great job. Can we just thank him for talking about Jonah last week? And so today we're going to wrap things up by looking at this concept of recalculating when it feels hopeless. We've been singing about hope all day, but no doubt some of you, probably some of you who came up to the tables looking for the recalculating cards that we have in front of you, and you picked up one, and then you saw the next phrase and went, I think that one applies just as much. And you picked up two, and then you went to the next one, and maybe you picked up all four cards because maybe you feel hopeless. And if you're watching us online, I want you to know you're a part of our extended family, our online family. You matter to us. We're here, and you can download those same cards at blackhawkministries.org slash recalculating. You can also revisit that to have those moving forward. But today we're going to look at a story in Luke 24. So look there with me, Luke chapter 24. So here's what we've been doing. If you're new with us today, we've been looking at people in Scripture. We decided we're not going to call them characters because that sounds like a fairy tale. It's not a fairy tale, this book that we call the Bible. It's a historical, factual record of people just like you and just like me who had to recalculate in their life. And so here's what we've been doing. We've been walking through the Old Testament thus far, looking at people in Scripture who had to recalculate. They had their recal recalculation roads just like we have. And today I want to take us for this last installment, though you're going to continue recalculating in your life. Can I get an amen? We're going to look in the New Testament at Luke 24 because this is the day that Jesus has risen from the grave. And can I encourage you for a minute this morning? How about this side? You seem kind of quiet. I want to wake you up. Can I encourage you this morning? How about you guys on the balcony? Can I encourage you this morning? All right. And this side too, can I encourage you? How many of you know that Jesus went into a tomb, but he didn't stay there? He is risen! He is alive! And we can celebrate that today. And some of you, I know you say it's one thing to shout it from the rooftops. It's one thing for those words to roll off of our lips. But I still feel hopeless. God's got a word for you today, and I believe somebody's here it's going to leave here with a recalculation moment. So we're going to go on a journey today, a journey side by side, all of us together. Are you ready to walk with me? I got some new shoes since we're going on a journey. I'm wearing them today. You may not have gotten new shoes, but your shoes will do just fine for this journey. And so, you know, Psalm 119 verse 105 says something about uh, a light for our path. We've been talking about this path that leads us to the plans of God because his purpose is bigger than all the stuff that we run into in our life. And so Psalm 119, 105 says, Lord, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And so I went out and found the most godly shoes I could possibly find. You want to see them? Now, those are some godly shoes. You ready for this? There we go. Let the cameras get a good look. You ready for a light for your path today? Some of you, the rest of you are just like, man, I got to know where he bought those shoes. Here's what I'm going to do, though. Isn't that cool? I'm going to cut them off because you won't hear a word I say if I leave those on. We're going on a journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Luke ch chapter 24, Jerusalem to Emmaus, a seven-mile journey. And this journey is one that I think you can identify with, this Emmaus Road journey. And so my question is this, will you walk with me? Can we go on a journey together today because he is risen? And you know, the thing is, this story happens the day Jesus defeated death. And the people in this story felt very hopeless and you may feel very hopeless today, but here's what I want you to know. I think a lot of times we feel so hopeless in our recalculating journey because we look for hope in hopeless areas. We look for the living among the dead. 
Luke 24, verse 5, we're not going to read it. That's when the angels met the people at the tomb, and they said, where's Jesus? And he said, he's not here, he's risen. Why are you here looking for the living among the dead? You may wonder, why did they say that? I think it was because they knew, they felt hopeless and wanted to say, why do you look for someone who's alive? Didn't he tell you? He's just borrowing this tomb. He wasn't here to stay. He got a borrowed tomb because he wasn't going to be there very long. Didn't he tell you he was going to rise? So why are you here looking for life among death why are you looking for hope in a place of hopelessness because he's not here he is risen but we do that don't we we look for hope in hopeless areas we look for life in areas that are dead we look for life in a dead facebook comment section Mm. And we end up saying we're going to spend one minute make one comment, but we end up spending half of our week caught up in this dead Facebook thread that's going to take you nowhere. What about a text message thread that was dead a long time ago, but you're still there looking for hope in a hopeless place? Maybe it's a dead relationship. Maybe it's a dead pursuit that you keep running after. Maybe it's you pursuing the things that God wants for your life, but you run at it with your own strength, and that's a dead pursuit. Here's a better one for all of us in this place. We're in church today. Maybe you're looking for life in dead religion. Some of you thought, I could go to church today and it would check off that box for me. That's dead religion. It won't get you anywhere. I believe in church. I believe we should be here. Scripture mandates it that we should not forsake the gathering together, the celebration. But it all points to us going out there and being the church. Religion is not going to get you anywhere. That's why Jesus came. He came and paid that price so there could be a relationship that would trump religion any day of the week. Because he is risen. He's not in a tomb. He's alive today. So let's talk about today. What does Jesus do on the day he defeated death? Here's the thing. He's got 40 days at this point. He's going to be on earth for 40 days before he goes and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's got 40 days to convince the world, here I am. Maybe pull up his sleeves and show the scars on his wrist. He's got 40 days to make a difference. And so here's the thing. What does he do? He goes for a walk. Straps on his shoes, his sandals, and he goes for a walk. He goes towards this place that We don't even know where it's at on the map. Scholars sometimes will pinpoint where they think Emmaus would have been or where it is currently, but we really don't know where it is. So he goes to this place that we don't know with people that are barely named in Scripture. We're going to look at Cleopas. Somebody say Cleopas. That's a hard name to say, isn't it? And so here's what I'm going to do. I think Cleopas' friends, see what I'm saying? Cleopas and his friends, I think they called him Cleo. And so that's what we're going to do today. Can we call him Cleo? Is that heretical? All right, we're going to do that. We're going to call him Cleo, and so we'll talk about where he gets his name. It's in verse 18 in a minute. But Jesus takes a walk, and he reminds them, those people, these two travelers on the road to Emmaus, and he wants to remind you and me today that he's Lord in some big areas of life, and I want to give you three of those areas that will help you recalculate even when it feels hopeless. So if you're feeling hopeless today, This is for you. God's got a word for you in this place. If you don't feel very hopeless today, it's coming. You'll feel hopeless tomorrow or the next day. There's hopelessness that gets attached to this life. And so I've got a word for you that comes straight from Jesus himself. That's a pretty good source, wouldn't you say? So let's look. Number one, verses 13 through 20, we see some promises, some things about Jesus, how he's Lord in certain areas. Number one, Jesus is Lord in my detours. Can I preach to you for just a minute about your detour? I I preach way better, by the way, when you talk back. I also preach way shorter, because if you don't talk back to me, I think you're not hearing me, and I'll just say it again, and then maybe even again, and then before long, we miss lunch. Nobody wants to miss lunch, right? Can I preach to you for a minute about your detour? Let's do it. Let's talk about Jesus being Lord in my detour. Verse 13, let's read that together, and we see this this idea of detours. We're going to go through this one verse at a time. One verse at a time, so much in this passage. Verse 13, Luke 24, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. It's the same version as the Bibles around your seat, so you can follow along. That very day, what day was it? The day that Jesus defeated death. He's risen. He's come out of the grave. He's not found there anymore. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Let's stop there for just a minute, and I want you to realize what's happening here. Jesus went to a place that's not known on a map today. And he went there with two people that are not named in the Bible, except for here. One of them's not even named in this 
passage. Most scholars would believe that Cleopas had his wife with him. You don't really know, though. It doesn't say. It's just two people. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But he's going to an unknown place with some unknown people when he only has 40 days. Now, if I'm Jesus' PR representative, I'm saying, Jesus, that's probably not the best road to be on. If you want to make the most of these 40 days, you need to be in Jerusalem. Because get this, Jerusalem is the place where the Passover was just celebrated. Jerusalem is the place where all of this stuff had just happened, where Jesus had just died. Jerusalem is the place, get this, where the promised Holy Spirit was to come. That's where it was happening. Yet these people felt hopeless. Jerusalem is here, and they go this way. They put on their walking shoes. They walk away in a fit of hopelessness, not knowing where to turn. That's where Jesus decides to go spend the first of his 40 days. He goes and meets them in this very place. And, you know, I want to ask you, what kind of God is this that would speak to Cleo, that would speak to you, that would speak to me in crowds of hundreds and thousands, in this place, in this time, what kind of God is this? It's the kind of God that died on the cross for you. It's the kind of God that wants to speak into your life in this moment, in this season. Yes, in the hopelessness that you walk in right now. That's the kind of God that we serve. I love that picture of this. And two big things are happening right here in this place. So God has just defeated death, hell, and the grave. When Jesus came out of the tomb, with him came the keys to life, death, hell, and the grave. He had conquered all. He had won all. God is changing the course of not just history, but eternity. That's number one thing that's happening here. And I'm pretty glad it happened. Are you glad it happened? But then this, the second thing's happening in this story in Luke 24 with these two travelers. Not only did Jesus just win that victory, but he's walking with people who are going nowhere. He's walking with unnamed, unnoticed, hopeless people. That's what's happening here. And we know Cleo because he's named in verse 18, but we don't know. Maybe it's his spouse. Maybe it's a companion. We don't really know, but we don't know who's with him. And if it was his spouse, as many would believe, you know, it's probably that she's not named in Scripture because women weren't always treated with the utmost respect in this time in history. They're often unnoticed, unnamed, marginalized, did you know that we serve a God? What kind of God is it that would speak to those kind of people? We serve a God who speaks to the marginalized and cares about the unnoticed people in the world. Did you know that? Maybe you feel like you're not noticed or you don't matter. I want you to know in this place today that Jesus died for you. You matter just like Cleo matters, just like his travel companion matters, and just like the kids you know, when I look at Scripture, I love the story where Jesus took a little kid's lunch and did one of his greatest miracles of feeding thousands of people with the lunch of a little child. Now, what you've got to know about this season is not just did women often go unnamed and unnoticed and marginalized in this society and culture, but kids would often go uncounted. When they would count the multitudes, the kids and the women would often not even get counted in the number of things, yet Jesus took the lunch of a little kid, a marginalized, unnoticed, get them away from me kind of little little heathens can I get an amen right you've been that person you might have been that disciple saying Lord let me get them out of here for you but Jesus says no let them come to me they may not count in your math but in kingdom math that's where the multiplication happens some of you came in today feeling like you don't count in the numbers of heaven you feel marginalized you feel isolated alienated like you don't matter but you're the person that Jesus wants to walk with on the road. You're a recalculation road. And you know, I was reminded of this even this weekend here in this very room. I got to stand on a stage. I want to show you this picture. This is some of our BCS kids. Look at this picture. Let's get us a picture. Of the, there they are. This is Grandparents Day for our school. It's been a while since I've been able to tell you how proud of all of our ministries that I am here at Blackhawk. And I think this gives us a good picture. This is just first through sixth grade, folks. They're in our hallways in this place all week long. And I got to stand. Do you see the little hole in the front and middle? Right at the end. Because here's the thing. We got to ask at the end of this program, how do we follow the, all those kids singing Amazing Grace? My chains are gone. And so this year we said, let's just give the pastor the mic. 
That was a bad choice. So I got up, and I got to stand in that little black hole that you see there with all those kids, and I couldn't help but think how Jesus counts and numbers and cares about those little lives that we get to invest in every single day. Not only are those little ones the people that Jesus cares about, but you are that person. You matter to the kingdom of God. Some of you came today just to hear that. Not from me, because my word means nothing. It's his word that counts, and you matter to him. We're going to go on this recalculation road today, and somebody's leaving this place with a detour, but a good one. Jesus is Lord in my detours, and hey, I know I'm still on verse 13. I saw the looks, especially over in this section. I saw it. I know I'm still on verse 13. I'm going to get moving a little faster. Look at verse 14 with me. Now, before we do, i got one more thing to say. (laughs) You know, a lot of times we look for God in the destination, don't we? The dreams, where we want to end up. But I want to submit to you today that we often look for God in the destination, but he wants to meet us in the detours. You don't want to look for God on that road that you ended up on, the season of life of hopelessness that you're in now, you'd rather think about Jesus meeting you at the place that you've been praying for when he brings you out of the mess that you find yourself in. Can I get an amen? In your notes it says Jesus is the destination. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the destination, but he meets us in our detours. Just like he does in this passage. God is not the God of arrival. He's the God of the next step. Remember that when we talked about Abraham and uncertainty? God's the God of the next step. Just take another step. Just take one more step. He's not just the God of arrival. He's not just the God of destination. He's the God of the detours. He's the God of the details that get you to where you are going. And he's the God when I'm strong. He's the God when I'm weak. He's the God when I'm right. He's the God when I'm wrong. He walks with me and he talks with me. That is the God that we serve. You should be excited about that because we don't deserve to go on a road with a Savior, yet he walks with me and he talks with me. And you know, I want to tell you something that I believe is going to happen today, that Jesus followed them to the wrong place. Again, Emmaus. Why Emmaus? Everything was going to happen in Jerusalem. Jesus followed them to the wrong place. You ready for this? Because grace will chase you down and meet you in your detour. It was a seven-mile journey, verse 13 tells us. And in the Bible, seven is the number of completion. Somebody say completion. Guess what? Your journey's not quite completed yet. But this idea of completion in the Bible, you see it, a good example is in creation. It's six days God created the earth. Pretty impressive, right? But the seventh day was pretty important because what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. He didn't rest, though, because he was tired. He rested because he was done. And one of these days, he's going to look at you and say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm done. Let's rest in eternity. But here we are today, and it still feels hopeless because we're not done yet. Look at somebody say, I'm not done. <laughs> Tell them, mean it. You've got to mean it more than that. I'm not done because he's not done with you. He's not finished with you yet. He's still getting to that place of completion. Let's look at verse 14 together right now. Verses 14 and 15. And they were talking with each other about all the things, these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus drew near and went with them. Some of you are like Cleo and his companion, and your discussions have been centered around hopelessness. You feel hopeless in a relationship, You feel hopeless in that job. You've lost a loved one. You're battling a divorce. Your walking, talking relationships or conversations have been pretty hopeless lately. I love what Jesus does. Then there's Jesus. I just love my Jesus. Then there was Jesus. In hopelessness, how do we recalculate? Well, we walk with Jesus. And he just meets us right where we are, even when we're going off course. Anybody glad of that today? Verses 16 and 17. I love this next verse because it's real and it's raw and it's where we are. Verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, this is the words of Jesus, What is this conversation you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. 
what is it that's keeping you today from recognizing the presence of God in your life? You know, the scripture says they were kept from recognizing. They didn't know it was Jesus. They were kept. Some people would say that God kept them from recognizing that, that he didn't want them to know yet. You could, you could get there, but I'm of a different opinion when I read this. I think that it was their blindness, their hopelessness, that they were caught in the middle of that kept them from recognizing the presence of God. Some would disagree and say God had a lesson here. That's not the point. I, the point is I believe that we, like Cleo, like his, his companion, we get kept from seeing where God is at work so many times in our life. I've asked myself this week, how many times have I missed a miracle because I'm consumed by my mess? How many times do I miss the miracles of God because all I can see is the mess of my life? Maybe today it's not about what's happening to me as much as I've been making it. Maybe today it's not as much about the to me as it is the what he wants to do through me. Maybe that's where you find yourself today. And I love this passage too, by the way. You think the Bible's boring. If you think the Bible's boring, do not raise your hand. I promise you will get some mean looks if you do that, but some of you, I've heard people say, well, the Bible's just boring. I would challenge you and say, you ready for this? Can I be bold today? If you think the Bible's boring, I think maybe it's not the Bible that's boring, it's you that's boring. Because when I read my Bible, I get excited. When I read my Bible, I see real, raw, humorous, amazing, life-changing stuff in every twist and in every turn. Because I want you to get the picture right here. Jesus is walking and talking with these two, and he is. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, by whom, through whom, and for whom everything that was made was made. The author, finisher of my faith, the name at which every knee will bow, every tongue will confess confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father, the one who has an explicit, direct, unique purpose for Cleo, for his companion, for you, for me, and for all of us in the world today, is walking and talking with them, and he walks up and stands beside them and says, hey, what you guys talking about? That's some funny stuff. I don't care who you are. That's just, he, he doesn't, and then later they go on, we're going to read this in a second, and they tell him about Jesus. So they're telling Jesus about Jesus and about how other people couldn't find Jesus to Jesus. And he lets them talk. He lets them talk. Has God ever let you talk? Oh man, there's so many times where I should have just... But God has grace, doesn't he? He walks with us and talks with us even when we don't make sense. And Jesus, you know what I love about this picture too? Jesus entered their sadness. He walked with them in their deepest, darkest moments of sadness. And they were explaining to the one who created life the way life was supposed to turn out. You ever done that? You feel like Cleo now, don't you? I know I have as I've looked at this story and you know, a lot of times we think that the God who knows that the birds of the air have fallen from the sky doesn't know about our hopelessness, or we feel like our brokenness and sadness would chase God away, but the Bible says to us that a broken and contrite heart the Lord will not despise. It's in our brokenness that our eyes are open to the blessings that God has for our lives. Look at verse 18, we'll read verses 18 through 20. Then one of them named Cleopas, there he is, hey Cleo, everybody say, hey Cleo, <laughs> answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? <laughs> I just love it. You'll get it one day. Verse 19, <laughs> and he said to them, I love this part, what things? <laughs> well, I don't know, tell me. I won't show you my wrist yet. I love that Jesus in his compassion and grace in this moment. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was, underline that, a man who was a prophet and mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, verse 20, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. They're telling Jesus about Jesus, yet Jesus listens and he walks with them. And sometimes we do that too, don't we? We want to tell Jesus what he needs to do with my life, what he needs to do with my church, what he needs to do with my kids. 
But what we need to realize is what Cleo is walking on a road to realize in this season of his life is that it's not your church. It's not your kids. It's not your life. It's not mine. Jesus says, I will build my church. And guess what? The best part about that, you may feel like you got released from that equation. No. Who is his church? You and me. We are his church. So when Jesus says, I'll build my church, it's not him snatching it away from us, though he could, because it is his. It's him saying, I'm going to build you. I'm going to build the people like Peter, the knuckleheads that can't do anything right at times. I'm going to take them, and I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to do things that don't make sense, and I'm going to help them recalculate, and I will build my church, and even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That's the God that we serve, but sometimes we miss what is because we're stuck in what was. Can I ask you, are you missing what is or what God will do because you're stuck in what was? Think of Cleo in this situation. He's standing beside the great I am, but he starts with he was. He was a prophet, but he's gone you do that sometimes, like me. We stand next to and in the presence of the great I am, but tell him what was. I pray we don't miss what God has for us. Look at the second thing here. That's the detour. We see they're on this detour and how Jesus meets them in the detour. But starting in verse 21, let's look together. One of the most powerful verses, I think, for us, if you're feeling hopeless today, helps us see the second promise. Jesus is Lord in my detours, but Jesus is Lord in my disappointments. Verse 21 says this, but we had hoped, say we had hoped, underline that, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. It's the third day, but evidently he didn't do what he said. We had hoped he was the one. Some of you are in this place, and I want you to know that you feel hopeless sometimes because real hope, maybe we're grasping onto things that aren't real hope. Real hope can hold on on Friday knowing that Resurrection Sunday is on the way. Jesus died on a Friday. Real hope is tested on the Fridays of your life when everything seems hopeless and you know, you're on the road to nowhere. You're on the road to Emmaus. You've got your shoes on. You're walking as best as you can, but you've gone off on this detour and you feel disappointed like Cleopas and his companion. That's where God meets you. Some of you are here and you would say, I had hope the medicine would work. You would say, I had hoped I would be married by now. I had hope that this struggle wouldn't still be a part of my life. And I prayed, and I had hope that God would answer me, but he must not care. He's so silent. He must be this distant million miles away God because he hasn't changed my situation. I had hoped that he would show up. I had hoped in this season of my life I wouldn't be where I am, that I wouldn't be here, but I would be there. I had hoped. They had hoped that Jesus was going to be the one that they had talked about, that they had discussed. That's where we end up so many times. And you know, could it be that we look for God in our dreams, what we hope for, our expectations? We look for God often in our dreams, but he wants to stop and meet us in our disappointments. Maybe that's where he's at work today, is in your disappointment. You've just been looking to the dream, not that he didn't put it there. He may have or he may not have. The point is this, though. Maybe we get so fixated on what we wish was that we miss the right now, even the stuff we don't like that God desires to work in the most. If you trust his promise, his purpose, our charge is just to walk in his path. That's my challenge to you today. And also, don't judge a journey before it's over. You notice they're still on, I don't know, the middle of the journey. They're not at mile seven yet. Don't judge your journey or the journey of somebody else's based on where they're supposed to be at mile 7 when they may still be at mile 1.5. You may still be at mile 1.5. Don't judge the end of the journey by mile 1.5. Just take another step. Just walk in his path. Even when he seems silent, still take another step. Still trust his purpose. Trust in his path that he has marked out for you, and he'll lead you to his plan if you take another step. So let's keep walking together on this journey. Verse 22 through 24, I love 
where Jesus comes in right after they continue here. They continue, Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, first of all, they went to the wrong place. He's not in the tomb. He's on the road. Aren't you glad he was on the road? The tomb was vacant. They didn't see him there, and they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Verse 24, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then he talks to them, but before that, remember not to judge. They were Cleo's judging these people who couldn't see Jesus when he couldn't even see the gaps in his own walk with Jesus. Don't do that. Don't be that person. He's thinking about caught up in that, tying it to his own hopelessness. They went to the wrong place. And a lot of times we, like them, when we can't find the reason, we just decide, let's just get off the road. But maybe God is reminding you just to take another step. In your notes, it says that God is just as willing. Get this. Write this down. Keep this with you this week. God is just as willing to meet you in the mundane as he is in the miraculous A lot of times we look for God to show up in the dramatic moments of our life, but he wants to show up in the details, in the disappointments, in those things that don't seem to make a lot of sense. He's willing to meet you in the mundane, the monotonous, those painstaking steps in your life, just like he is willing to do miraculous healings, just like he's willing to miraculously pull you from the clutches of sin and death and hell and the grave. He's willing to walk with you in the everyday life that you face. Verses 25 through 27, Jesus responds. Verse 25, he said to them, O foolish ones, after he'd listened and had all this patience, and slow of heart to believe what all the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. In the middle of their disappointments, Jesus wanted to speak. And I want to challenge you today, if you feel hopeless, let Jesus remind you who he is in this place today because he is speaking. Give Jesus a chance to show you what he can do in your life, to show you who he is in your life. Even if you can't, there was an old song, if I can't trace his hand, trust his heart. If you can't trace his hand, trust his heart today in this place. Keep walking. Keep stepping. Hold on to hope. The last thing we see, I'll end with this last thought about promises and how we can walk with God, not just in the detours. He's Lord in the detours. He's Lord in the disappointments, but he's Lord in the dead ends. They get to the end of the journey, what should be a dead end in their life. Some of you don't tell me, but how many of you would say, I feel like I've already run into the dead end, and I feel like I've run into this ending of this season, and I don't know where to turn, and I may just give up. Well, don't give up yet. Look at verse 28 with me, verse 28 and 29. So they drew near to a village where they were going, and he acted, Jesus did, acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, join them in this, in this moment. They urged him strongly. They still don't know who he is. Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Some of you just cry out to Jesus and say, stay with me one more step. I don't know what you're doing. You may say, I don't know Jesus. You may say, I'm not even sure I fully trust Jesus with my life yet. This is a place you can belong before you believe. Are you with me? You can belong at this place before you believe because that's the people Jesus ran after. So ask him to stay with you one more step. Ask him to stay with you one more day. Ask him to show you who he is and he will patiently listen and walk alongside you in your life just like he did in Cleo's. He's the Lord of my dead ends. Verse 30 and 31. When he was at the table, I love this part. It's the best, one of the best communion passages in the Bible. We don't often use it, though. We're going to do the Lord's Supper together in a few minutes. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Have you ever noticed that Jesus is always taken over? He went in to be a visitor, but he took the bread. He blessed it, and he broke it, and he directed where it was going. He goes in to this house and to our lives where we think he's coming in as a visitor, but he ends up being the host. I think that's a pretty good place for us to get to in our journey, on our road of recalculating. Are you with me? You thought he was just going to be a visitor, but today he's going to be the host. Verse 31, after he gave it to him, their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, 
and he vanished from their sight. I would guess, now you don't know why they recognize what opened their eyes. I can just picture this. He blessed it and broke it. He took it, first of all, he took it. <laughs> he took it and blessed it and broke it and gave it to him. I can just picture, this is just my opinion, it's just a word picture that I've made in my head of what could have happened in this moment, but I can imagine that it was the wrists that were torn to shreds that had scars from dying on a cross as he gave it to them. They saw something that was a lot more than bread. They saw something that represented a lot more than the hopelessness of their life. They saw the wrists where the nails pierced the hands of Jesus, and they remembered and recognized that he was still Lord, that he's still alive. Today's going to be that day in somebody's life today as we remember as we do the Lord's Supper, as we look at this scripture, it's going to be a time where you remember what he's done for you, how he's been there for you, how he's revealed himself to you, let you touch his wrist, and it's going to lead you to a place of recognizing how he's at work in your life. It's time to remember in a way that will help you recognize that he is still Lord, that he's still working on you. It's in the brokenness, the broken bread, the broken Savior, the brokenness that came from the hopelessness that they walked in, that their eyes of belief were opened. It's in their hopelessness that the eyes of their hope were opened up. God's going to do that in your life, I believe, today. Look at verses 32 through 34 with me. They said to each other, he left, he's vanished, he's gone. Can you imagine this conversation? Oh, man, I'll, I'll be honest. Can you give me some grace for a minute? I would probably go, you idiot! What are you doing? You didn't recognize him? Oh, we're crazy! What are you, oh, what's going on? How did we not know? How did you not know? It's your fault, right? That's what you would have done. Your fault. You should have told me. You knew it was him. How did you not know, right? But here we are. Their eyes were open. Life has changed. Verse 32, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us? No kidding. While we, while he talked with us on the road and when he opened to us the scriptures, and get this, verse 33, they rose. They rose. When you recognize, when you remember, you have to rise up and do something with it. Some of you are recognizing some stuff today, but it's not enough to see it. You've got to go and believe it and walk it out and rise up and go somewhere with it. That's what they did. And they rose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those that were gathered them together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Stop there for a minute and just think about what God is helping you recognize, what God is trying to show you. i got a word for somebody in this place today, and it's about resurrection do you know that resurrection does not just mean that Jesus got up? Resurrection means that you can get up too. Resurrection doesn't just mean that he got up, but that I can too. Maybe it's time to stand up, to recognize what God's up to, that he's Lord in your detours, he's Lord in your disappointments, and he is Lord even in your dead ends. We bow with me? Just... Close your eyes for a minute. Reflect on what that may mean for you. In a few moments, we're going to take a time of communion together. But before we do, I just think it's important for us to realize that sometimes we get stuck on the crucifixion when we're sitting next to resurrection. You've been stuck on crucifixion, perhaps, but the resurrection has already happened, and faith is going to do something in your life today. Faith is going to keep your hopes up, even though your situation may be going down. Nobody looking around for a moment. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, I want to challenge you to ask how God wants to do something new in your life today. Maybe it's in a detour, a discouragement, a disappointment, or a dead end. And talk to him about that in this place. And if you're here today, nobody's looking around because this is just you and Jesus. And you would say, I feel hopeless today, but I realize that today is the day where I need to give my life to Jesus. Today is the day where I need to reach salvation. I would love to tell you, Pastor, that... I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die, that I have a personal relationship with Jesus, and I'm 100% confident that I'm going to spend eternity with God in heaven because of a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, that he died for me and he rose again. I believe that, and I know I've walked into that, trusted in that to save me, but I can't. Maybe that's you. You would say, I just can't say that I'm 100% there. Well, the gospel is for you. 
You're those people that Jesus ran after. His grace is chasing you down on your road. Your recalculation road today in this place. And I'm not going to lead you in a prayer because I think your heart's already screaming it. But I want you to know what the gospel is. The gospel is simple. It's not something that I could do. It's not something that anybody in this world could do. It's something that Jesus already did. The gospel is good news because it's already happened. Jesus already did it. He's already paid the price. He died on that cross after living the sinless life that you couldn't live and that I couldn't live. He paid the price, the penalty for our sins. Our sin separates us from God. We don't like to use that word a lot. We don't want to offend, but you're sinful, and I'm sinful, and it separates us from God, all of us. But he paid that price for you and for me, that penalty we could never pay. But it didn't end there. He went to a borrowed tomb because he didn't plan to stay. He rose from the grave, and he defeated your sin. And he gave you a spot in the family of God. Where you come in is you must believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he's Lord. That's what scripture tells us. And it says you shall be saved. Not you might be if God's in a good mood that day. No, you will be saved. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It can happen today. I don't care what the enemy's whispering in your ear. I don't care who may have told you you could never get to that place. Jesus doesn't care. He's meeting you on your recalculating road, and today is the day of your salvation. Would you cry out to him? I'm just going to give you a moment right now in this place to just say to him, Jesus, I need you. Ask him to save you. You, it doesn't have to say it, you don't have to say it like I just said it. He doesn't want you to say it like I said it. He wants you to say it from your heart to his. So we cry out to him in the silence of this moment right now. Nobody's looking around. It's just you and me and Jesus for a minute. There's power in acknowledging that step. And I want to give you some next steps if that's you today. So all heads bowed. If that was you today on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to acknowledge that. Nobody's going to take you out of here. You can stay here just like the rest of us. But I just want to stop and pray for you and give you some next steps if that's you. I want to celebrate with you in this moment. So on the count of three, if you gave your life to Jesus in this place, today's the day of your salvation. You nailed that down. I want you to lift your hand and lift it high and lift it proud. And I'm going to pray for you on the count of three. Ready? One two, three. Would you raise your hand? Say pray for me all over. Oh, praise God. Wow. Keep them high. I see you. I see you. Wave me down. Praise God. I see you, young man. I see you, ma'am. I see you. You can put your hands down anybody else. Thank you, Jesus. May this never get old for us, folks. God, I thank you for these who've taken a step of faith. They've leaped. God, they said, I trust you. You've won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. And from this day forward, these that have lifted their hands don't fight for victory anymore. They fight from the victory that you won. God, I'm humbled by salvation because none of us deserve it. Yet here we are. So God, I thank you for helping these recalculate in this place today. God, I pray that they would know that disappointments are still going to come. Detours are still going to come. Dead ends are still going to come. But now they have a Savior walking the path with them. And they've got a family who's going to go on the journey together right beside them. So God, I pray for these who've taken that step. God, I ask that today, Lord, there are going to be several that get to partake of communion for the very first time as a member of the family of God. Heaven is shouting and celebrating in this place, and so God, we do too. Will you celebrate with me right now as we lift it up and pray? Just celebrate. Welcome these to the family of God.